There have been a shocking number of UFO sightings and ET encounters which have occurred in Sector Pereso, located in the Rio Abajo area at the foothills of the El Yonque rainforest in Puerto Rico. El Yonque is known for being a hotbed of all things odd and weird, including bloodthirsty vampire-like cryptids, strange cattle deaths, UFOs, time slips, disappearances, and more. For myself, one of the most interesting cases occurred in November 1979. It involved the sighting of a UFO, which was followed by an encounter with a little figure described as looking like a goblin. Well-known and respected Puerto Rican-based UFO researcher George Martin, accompanied by fellow researcher and architect William Santana Font, actually visited the family at their residence in Villa Carolina in the municipality of Carolina for a sit-down interview. The family included Edwin Rodriguez Castro, his wife Carmen Delgado, and their two daughters. Castro and his wife owned a farm in Paraiso that they would occasionally visit, often spending two or three days there at a time. This is where the first strange incident occurred. It began one evening in November 1979. Carmen was driving in a minibus with her two daughters to their farm in Paraiso. It was around 9.30 p.m., as they made their way down the darkened road, the three of them were surprised when a saucer-shaped object encircled with multiple colored lights suddenly descended over them. Carmen and her daughters were absolutely terrified watching the strange craft hover over the vehicle, and Carmen pushed the gas accelerator to the floor in hopes of fleeing from the object, but it seemed to keep up effortlessly. Carmen's daughters entered a state of hysteria due to the fear they felt. Carmen was also frightened but tried to remain as calm as possible as she felt it was the best way to protect her daughters. At this point the daughters, completely seized by terror and hysteria, grabbed her by the neck and scratched her shouting that the quote, Martians wanted to take them. Carmen continued to drive at a high rate of speed all while honking the horn in hopes it would dissuade whomever was inside the object from pursuing them. As they finally arrived at the farmhouse where Edwin was waiting for them, they all watched in utter amazement as the large, dish-shaped object suddenly moved off where it entered or seemed to merge with the side of one of the mountains in the forested area, higher up, disappearing there. Carmen and her two daughters were quite shook up by the experience, and the next day, together with Edwin, they returned to their residence in Villa Carolina. They just wanted to put the strange experience behind them. Sadly, that was not to be the case. For the very next night, at around 9 p.m., the family were alerted to some, quote, beautiful music similar to that of a flute coming from the backyard. Following the sound, the family retreated to the back area of the house where the daughter's rooms were. In one of those rooms was a window, and this is where the music could be heard the most clearly. They peered out to see what or who was creating the music, and were astonished to see a bizarre figure standing before them. Looking out the window, they could see a, quote, little goblin. He appeared to be standing on the top of an electrical transformer box from the electric power authority that was placed in their yard. It was like a little man, the couple told Martin and Font, similar to a goblin. He stood no more than three and a half feet tall, dressed in a green uniform, similar to a military fatigue suit, but like iridescent, with long sleeves down to the wrists and a small button around his neck. He had a wide dark belt and wore boots that ended in a point, with pants tucked inside the boots. He also had, quote, something like a weird hat on his head, which looked like a fireman's hat, kind of pointed up, with eaves on the sides all around. But the most impressive thing, according to the family, 
were the creature's eyes, which emanated light and were very striking with an almost hypnotic look. We couldn't see the color of his skin very well because it was at night, but it looked grayish or greenish dark and he had little ears like pointed up, a very strange thing. According to everyone, the creature just stood there watching them, motionless. But as the two daughters began to shout at it, and Edwin ran outside after it, it moved quickly and disappeared. The family and their neighbors searched the area, but it was in vain, as they found no trace of the entity. While they could not prove it, Edwin and Carmen were convinced that the previous night's UFO encounter an observance of the object entering the mountainside in Pariso was somehow related to the sighting of the strange goblin entity in their backyard. They wanted something from us, and they came here, but what could they want? Or is it they want to communicate something to us? Carmen asked us of the investigators. Something important happens up there in the rainforest. Those beings are there because we saw that ship enter one of the mountains. In between taking notes, George Martin sketched out the goblin entity based on the details provided by Edwin and Carmen and the two daughters. The family noted that it was nearly identical to what they saw that November evening in 1979. This case ranks up there with the 1955 Kelly Hopkinsville encounter as one of the better UFO goblin cases that I'm aware of. And similar to the Kelly Hopkinsville case, the goblin's appearance was preceded by the sighting of a UFO hours earlier. Carmen's initial encounter while driving to the farm with her two daughters is not unlike other cases in which witnesses in remote locations report that their vehicle was followed by a strange light or craft. In this case, the object was described as descending on the car not unlike how a stray cat might pounce on a mouse in a field. The craft was close enough for the occupants of the vehicle, Carmen and her daughters, to see it clearly. Further, the daughters were overcome with such an intense fear that it caused them to become nearly hysterical and even attacked their mother as she drove. That type of fright response I've only heard of in a couple of cases. Upon arriving at their destination, the family claims that the craft moved away and either entered or merged into the side of a mountain, a detail that no doubt interested those researchers who believe that Al Yonke might be home to a secret UFO base. The very next night, at around the same time, now in a different location, the family again experienced something anomalous. Music, followed by the appearance of a goblin-like figure. At no point on the second night did the family describe seeing a UFO, though it would be somewhat odd to not think that the two incidents, the UFO sighting and the goblin, were connected in some way. And if they are indeed connected, I suspect they are, then this would suggest that the visitors must have followed the family to this other location. The pleasant flute-like music heard by the family has also been reported in El Yonke Mountain, Mount Britain, and in the Pacacos in the rainforest, noted George Martin. The same mysterious flute-like music has also been heard along the Pascagoula River in the U.S. Of course, that was the location of a very famous UFO ET encounter. In this case, the music was used to lure the family towards the back of the house, where the goblin creature was apparently waiting for them. Why was it there? What exactly was it trying to accomplish? In most cases in which entities are sighted, it usually involves a witness opening a curtain to see something scurrying around in the yard, under the cover of darkness, seemingly doing its best to avoid detection. In this case, the entity seemed to actually make an effort to be seen, not only by calling them forth via the music, but by standing atop a power box where it could be seen clearly. Even stranger, it did not seem to make an effort to move until the family reacted to it. Again, I wonder what it was trying to accomplish by doing this. Was it a threat meant to indicate that the visitors knew where they lived and who they were? Was it a confirmation that they existed? But what would the visitors care if the family knew they existed? 
Why would they want to threaten the family? None of it makes much sense, but trying to figure out why the visitors do what they do, well, that's part of what makes ufology and the paranormal in general so intriguing. I guess I would be remiss if I didn't mention the numerous connections to fairy lore, from the appearance of the creature, which in look and dress very much resembles a character, we might assume, some type of fairy or leprechaun. Further, the use of music to draw the witness to them is something that pops up in tales of the good folk and mermaids. It's interesting how much these myths and legends of old line up with modern day encounters. Anyway, I found the Villa Carolina case to be interesting and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.